For all in attendance, please note that today's meeting is being live streamed on the ncpc.gov website. Uh, we do have a quorum, so we will call the meeting to order. We will proceed by the agenda that has been uh, properly publicly advertised. Agenda item number one is the report of the chairman, and I don't have anything of significance to report. Uh, so agenda item number two is the report of the executive director, who always has something. I, have, I actually have two things to report today. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome our guests. We have a group of undergraduate students from the University of Michigan Architecture Program who are here uh, to do a design studios on memorials. So they are here to listen to the Eisenhower Memorial uh, presentation. So we welcome you to NCPC. Uh, secondly, uh, Lee Webb. I recently joined our agency as our historic preservation specialist. He brings over 20 years of experience through his work at the Advisory Council of Historic Preservation, the Georgia State Historic Preservation Division. He also served as a preservation planner for the city of Alexandria and Savannah, Georgia. Uh, Lee most recently served as the executive director of Thomasville Landmarks, a 50-year historic preservation organization in Georgia. So welcome to you, Lee. Thank you. So that concludes my presentation. You do have a written report before you. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Acosta. Uh, agenda item number three is the legislative update. Uh, General Counsel, Ms. Schuyler. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have one item on which I'd like to report. It is a bill, H.R. 216, um, called the Second Division Memorial Modification Act, which was introduced in the House on January 3rd of this year. Um, it's been referred to the House Committee on Natural <coughs> Resources. The bill authorizes this is a very long name for a sponsor, the, quote, Scholarship and Memorials Foundation of the Second Indian Head Division Association, unquote, to place three benches at the Second Division Memorial located in President's Park, bordering Constitution near 17th Street Northwest. The benches honor members of the Second Infantry Division killed in the Cold War in Korea, the war in Iraq, and the war in Afghanistan. The bill specifically holds that the design and placement of the benches shall be governed by the requirements of the, of the Commemorative Works Act, so this commission will be called upon to review it if passed and enacted into law. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Schuyler? Agenda item number four is the consent calendar, and we have only two items. Item 4A is for comments on the 35% site and building plans for parcel L1 at the Southeast Federal Center. That's brought to us by the General Services Administration. And agenda item number 4B is the approval of preliminary and final site and building plans with comments for the DC United Stadium located in Southwest Washington submitted, by DC, submitted to us by DC United in coordination with the District of Columbia Department of General Services. If there are no questions. Is there a motion on the consent calendar? So moved. It's been moved and Second. seconded. All in favor of the consent calendar to say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Carries. Agenda item number 5A is <coughs> approval of the final site and development plans for phase one of the White House fence replacement. Um, we previously reviewed the concept and preliminary plans in July and December, respectively, in 2016. Uh, Mr. Fliss, welcome. Yes, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission. The National Park Service, in cooperation with the United States Secret Service, has submitted final site development plans for phase one of a new perimeter fence and gates at the White House complex. As, uh, as you know, the Commission provided preliminary approval of the project back in December with comments and recommendations which have helped guide further refinement of the plans. The White House, as you know, is the executive office of the President and also the primary residence of the First Family. It is located in downtown Washington, D.C., between Pennsylvania Avenue, E Street, 15th, and 17th Streets, Northwest. The current location of the White House fence is outlined here in yellow on the screen in front of you, and it encloses approximately 18 acres. Uh, the White House complex is just one component of the larger President's Park, which is outlined here in white, which also includes Lafayette Park, the Eisenhower Executive Office Building, the Treasury Building, and, as well as the Ellipse, which is located to the south. This is a more detailed site plan of the White House complex and the surrounding buildings. 
The Commission again is today considering a new perimeter fence and, and gates as the first phase of a comprehensive security plan. A future phase will also look at the Eisenhower Executive Office Building as well as the Treasury Building. The White House has actually had a low wall or fence since around 1803 and over time it has continued to evolve eventually reaching the form which you would recognize on the on the site today. Of course the White House is a major visitor destination and the, the, the house itself and the grounds are also viewed and experienced through the fence from a variety of perspectives. As such, staff has evaluated the proposed fence and gates <coughs> based upon a number of considerations including historic preservation, urban design, as well as visitor experience. As I mentioned, um, this project is the first phase of security improvements that will eventually include other portions of President's Park, including the Treasury Building and Eisenhower Executive Office Building, which are shown on the screen. As such, staff believes it will be helpful for the Park Service and Secret Service to provide the Commission an update on the anticipated schedule and scope of future phases of security improvements at President's Park. And further, the unique character and condition of the public spaces surrounding and adjacent to the Eisenhower Executive Office Building as well as the Treasury Building may require different security solutions than those developed for this first phase. So going back to preliminary review, the Commission approved the site plan, uh, site development plans and provided a number of uh, recommendations and comments. In particular, the Commission supported the use of pencil point anti-climb measures, requested the fence piers be reduced in size where possible, and also asked the applicant to evaluate if the piers could be removed from, from some locations along Pennsylvania Avenue. The Commission also supported a vehicular gate design with minimal solid elements to maintain views and did not support the use of the crash rated wedge barrier. So just as a reminder, the existing fence is six feet tall on a generally a two foot base. The proposed fence will be 10 foot seven inches tall on an 18 inch stone base. And anti-climb measures will be located on top and they're about a foot in height. The existing stone piers shown here will also be increased in scale. This does reflect the U.S. Secret Service's recommendation for the fence height consistent with your previous review in December. So based upon uh, your comments as well as those from the Commission of Fine Arts along with staff discussion, the applicant has further refined a number of the fence details. I'm going to walk you through your previous recommendation and also show you how the design has changed in response. So first, the Commission expressed support for the use of pencil point anti-climb measures as they best balance security and design in an unobtrusive manner. <coughs> the Commission also did not support the use of cross teeth anti-climb measures as they appear to detract from the visitor experience. So in response, the applicant has eliminated the cross teeth design on the left here and has utilized the pencil point motif shown on the right in a manner that's integrated with the overall design of the fence. Many of the other elements, including the finials and post tops, have also been refined. At preliminary review, the Commission also requested the applicant consider reducing the size of the fence piers where possible, and also consider removing the fence piers from the pedestrian gates located along Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, this re request was in response to viewing the scale and the massing of the piers at the uh, on-site mock-up. So in response, the, uh, the applicant has carefully reduced the size and scale of the piers, considering both their overall massing as well as their proportion um, of elements. So here you can see the um, width and depth of the piers have been reduced about three inches. Um, and then again, this is in both dimensions, from about four feet to three foot nine inches. The height of the pier cap has also been reduced several inches. This is shown here. And further, the applicant um, evaluated the pier joints and has also modified them to be better in proportion with the overall scale of the pier. In total, staff believes that these changes are responsive to the Commission's requests and are appropriate to the design of the project. As I mentioned, the Commission also requested the applicant consider removing the piers from the pedestrian gates along Pennsylvania Avenue, and those are shown here. <coughs> And then to the right is the vehicular gate. 
the applicant has uh, concurred with this recommendation and has removed the piers from the pedestrian gates. So you can see that here. Staff believes that this change helps open up views to the White House grounds and also allows the vehicular gates to stand as distinct features along the avenue. This is just a larger elevation of the fence along Pennsylvania Avenue, again showing the removal of those piers. Moving on, uh, regarding the fence gates, the Commission expressed support for a vehicular gate design that minimized solid elements, reduced clutter, and maintained views to the White House grounds. The Commission also stated it did not support the use of a crash-rated wedge barrier due to their visual impact. So just as a reminder, uh, there will be nine pedestrian gates and six vehicular gates um, located along the fence. That's shown in the site plan in front of you. Uh, the vehicular gates will also be improved with crash protection. So in response to the Commission's comments, the crash rated wedge barrier, um, shown here, was eliminated from consideration. Uh, the remaining two options were further evaluated. These include a crash rated gate and then a non-crash rated gate with additional bollards located behind. So here you can see the uh, vehicular gates located on Pennsylvania Avenue, located um, shown side by side. On the left is the crash rated gate, which includes a more solid base. Um, and then on the right is the non-crash rated gate, which is um, somewhat more open at the bottom, but it does include the bollards located behind. Um, the same options would generally apply to East and West Executive Drive. Again, here's the crash rated gate on the left and the non-crash rated gate with bollards on the right. The crash rated gate is supported by the applicant because of maintenance and operational concerns related to the addition of bollards and other equipment. And although this base is uh, solid, um, this will generally be below the line of view for most uh, people. Regarding the adjacent pedestrian gates shown here, staff recommends the use of the vertical picket design, which is uh, relatively simple and, and relatively transparent. This recommendation was also supported by the Commission of Fine Arts. The resulting combination of vehicular and pedestrian gates would balance both openness and operations while meeting Secret Service needs and is consistent with the Commission's original recommendation. And finally, a, a preliminary review, the Commission noted that the project components would continue to be refined. As shown through this presentation, um, additional design development has continued to improve the overall project elements. And this includes um, the piers and gates, which you've already seen, but also elements such as the post tops, shown here on the screen, as well as the finials. And I think there's a model that's being passed around. Overall, staff believes that these refinements have continued to improve the quality of the project. And so therefore, it is the executive director's recommendation that the commission approves the final site development plans for phase one of a new perimeter fence and gates at the White House complex, request that the Park Service and Secret Service provide an update on the schedule and scope of future improvements at President's Park, Notes that the different character and conditions of the public space around the Eisenhower Executive Office Building and the Treasury Building may require different security solutions and further supports the applicant's preferred design for vehicular gates on Pennsylvania Avenue, along with the more open picket design for the adjacent pedestrian gates. Uh, this concludes my presentation. Um, I'm available for questions, and I believe Mr. Tom Doherty with the United States Secret Services um, also would like to make a few comments. Thank you. It's been a long year. Um, if you think about it, we started this process uh, over a year ago um, and um, over three public hearings and multiple staff uh, meetings. And I want to thank, first of all, Chairman Bryant and commissioners for helping us with this process and also to you, Executive Director Acosta, for all the counsel and guidance that you've given to both the Park Service and the Secret Service in terms of sort of perfecting this process. Um, the recommendations are all completely in agreement with us. Um, we certainly are open to any other additional discussions. But again, I just wanted to thank you very much for helping us advance this important national security project. Um, as I started off a year ago, that the existing fence was deficient and no longer really a relevant to the modern age, uh, we uh, see and feel 
that particular uh, predicament every single day now at the White House, practically. So in any event, thank you very much for your help in this process. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm glad to answer them. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Mr. Doherty. We had a um, long discussion on this uh, in December when we approved the um, preliminary site development plans. We noted at that time that there would be continued uh, refinements in those that have taken place, as Mr. Fliss has outlined. With that, are there any additional questions or comments on this? And of course, Mr. Doherty and Mr. Stan are here for technical or planning uh, questions as well. Is there a motion? So moved. It's been moved and seconded. Sensing no uh, further discussion. Oh, yes, please, Ms. Steingasser. <coughs> Yes, I, I just want to um, support the, the staff's recommend, the executive director's recommendation, especially noting the unique character and the condition of the spaces along the Eisenhower and Treasury buildings, and state that when, when it comes to stage two, we expect to have a lot more uh, involvement sure. and concern over the interface with the public spaces and city. Indeed. Mr. May. Um, I would just say we certainly support that. And we're, you know, we want to make sure that we have uh, a good design as we move forward with uh, uh, phase two when that um, gets moving again. So, yep. Thank you very much. Additional comments? It's been properly moved and seconded. All in favor of the EDR say aye. 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 Opposed, no. And Mr. Doherty, congratulations. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Agenda item 5B is the approval of comments. For the, on, the, on the revised concept designs for the Dwight D. Eisenhower Memorial. And we have Ms. Lee. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. The National Park Service, on behalf of the Eisenhower Memorial Commission, has submitted a revised concept design for the Dwight D. Eisenhower Memorial. So the review process for the memorial has been conducted over a period of several years. Congress authorized the memorial in 1999, then in 2006. The commission approved the site and adopted a set of design guidelines for the memorial. Later in 2011, the commission provided comments on three concept design alternatives, followed by preliminary reviews in 2014. Most recently, most recently, the Commission approved the final plans for the memorial in July 2015. Concurrently, the Commission reviewed a related street closure and a transfer of jurisdiction of a portion of Maryland Avenue. And as a result of further consultation with the Eisenhower family, the applicant is proposing design modifications to the final plan, which results in today's revised concept design. So as you may recall, the, the site is located in southwest Washington, D.C., a block south of the National Mall and approximately four blocks west of the U.S. Capitol. Maryland Avenue runs diagonally through the site, fra uh, framing a view corridor towards the U.S. Capitol that extends all the way to the Jefferson Memorial. The site is bound by Independence Avenue to the north, 4th Street to the east, 6th Street to the west, and the Lyndon B. Johnson Department of Education headquarters to the south. The commission approved the site in 2006 because of its size, accessibility, and the unique relationship between Eisenhower's legacy and the federal entities and museums that surround the site. Maryland Avenue divides the site into different parcels, and the site is under three jurisdictions. Currently, Reservation 5, which you can see here, this triangle at the north, has a community garden and a fitness area and is under control of NPS. Maryland Avenue right-of-way is under the control of DDAT. And the triangular plaza here to the south and also the LBJ building are under control of GSA. Prior to construction, the entire memorial site, which you can see highlighted in green, will be transferred to NPS to create a unified parcel. Once built, NPS will maintain the memorial. GSA will retain control of a 50-foot buffer area, 
which you can see highlighted in orange between the memorial and the site. Uh, between the memorial site and the building. As part of the site approval process in 2006, NCPC developed a set of design principles to guide the memorial design. Basically, the intent of the principles is to preserve the more, uh, views of the Capitol along Maryland Avenue, enhance the nature of the site, create a unified memorial site that functions as a public space, reflect land plan principles, complement the architecture of the surroundings, respect the building lines and alignment of trees along Maryland Avenue, and incorporate significant green space. In general, the current proposal that I will share today continues to satisfy the intention of these principles. So the concept of the memorial is to commemorate Eisenhower's achievements as a military general and the 34th president of the United States, as well as the humble way in which he approached these roles based on a set of values he acquired during his childhood in Abilene, Kansas. The applicant has taken inspiration from the organization of the Lincoln Memorial and the notion of an object within an open air temple. The design team envisions the Eisenhower Memorial as a commemorative object placed within an urban room, as you can see here, within a surrounding precinct. To convey a sense of a layer experience, the applicant is using several memorial elements listed in this slide. So now I will walk you through the final plan approved by the Commission in the summer of 2015. So the plan included a central memorial core composed of freestanding bronze sculptures and quotations that recognize Eisenhower's achievements as a general and also as a president. A large stainless steel tapestry supported by a monumental colonnade and two freestanding columns that define the park space. You can see the columns highlighted in blue. It also included a landscape design that included several canopy and understory trees arranged in clusters throughout the site to frame Maryland Avenue view shed and entry plazas at the corners to serve as a transition from the busy surroundings and also wide pedestrian paths leading to the memorial core. The memorial also included a 2,400 square foot memorial information center containing restrooms, bookstore, and an NPS ranger station. And finally, it included a pedestrian promenade between the memorial and the LBJ building, providing outdoor seating areas in front of the cafeteria and also exhibit areas and a memorial <coughs> overlook that could accommodate public gatherings. In general, the current proposal maintains these elements. So now I will show you the, the changes that are before you today. The revised concept includes three design modifications which change the narrative of the memorial. The current proposal revises the artistic image on the tapestry, as you can see here in red, removes four trees and relocates the statue of Eisenhower as a young man. So now I will describe the refinements in more detail and share our staff analysis that supports the recommendation. I note that this is the current proposal and as a concept design, the project will continue to be refined in future months. Since the commission's final approval, the image for the tapestry has changed from a landscape scene of Abilene, Kansas, Eisenhower's hometown which was meant to symbolize his Midwestern values to a contemporary aerial view of Normandy, France along the coastline during peacetime where the D-Day invasion took place during World War II. This image includes Utah and Omaha beaches with point to hog in the center in, rem in remembrance of the sacrifices of D-Day. The image is meant to highlight Eisenhower's major achievement and represent his legacy and commitment to global peace. As you can see in these diagrams, the transparency levels of the tapestry have been maintained to ensure views of the LBJ building and retain the building's identity. The opacity of the 
tapestry will range from approximately 95% solid along the bottom of the tapestry here, transitioning to about 50% open in the middle and at, and at the top about 20%. So the tapestry will be more open towards the sky and more dense at the bottom. Here is a section through the side to give you an idea of the relationship between the tapestry and the LBJ building. As you can see, the top elevation of the tapestry aligns with the LBJ building framing the promenade. The tapestry is raised 20 feet from above the ground to allow pedestrian circulation underneath. You will notice that the tapestry will mostly be seen by pedestrians looking up. As you can see, the view shed in blue. So here is a picture of the physical model from the 2015 final design. The tapestry serves as a commemorative and urban design element, providing a visual separation from the LBJ building. <coughs> here is the revised tapestry image. The tapestry continues to provide a backdrop to the memorial. Staff finds that the overall placement, scale, and assembly of the primary elements have not significantly changed since final approval, including the stainless steel tapestry and supporting colonnade, freestanding columns, memorial core, landscaping, and information center. So here is a view of the previous tapestry along Maryland mm -hmm. Avenue. You can see how the trees depicted on the tapestry occupied a significant portion of the tapestry and serve as an extension of the landscape. And here is the revised image. The coastline sits low on the tapestry, occupying a narrow portion, while the clouds occupy about two-thirds of the tapestry. In 2011, the applicant created a series of mock-ups of the tapestry to demonstrate its transparency and also artistic quality. In order to ensure that the revised tapestry continues to create a legible image and maintain the level of transparency, staff request additional visual studies and a mock-up of the revised tapestry that addresses any impacts to the LBJ building. So the second change is related to the landscape. To create views to the new tapestry image, in particular the coastline, the applicant has pro proposed minor modifications to the landscape limited to the removal of four trees. You can see the trees highlighted here in red. You will notice that the portion of the tapestry that shows the focal point, which is Point du Hoc here, and the Normandy coastline is at the same height as the canopy, as the tree canopy. Therefore, the applicant has proposed to create these two view sheds with the removal of the four trees. Staff finds that the proposal strikes a balance between maintaining the approved landscape while creating views to the tapestry image. And staff also finds that the removal of the tree along Maryland Avenue right of way, which you, you can see here, does not impact the overall alignment of trees along the avenue. The last change proposed is the relocation of the John Eisenhower sculpture. <coughs> if you recall, the final design included a life-size statue of Eisenhower as a young man sitting on an overlook wall looking out towards his future achievements with a background of his hometown. At the time, the intent of the sculpture of John Eisenhower was to create a dialogue between his childhood in Abilene, Kansas in the background looking out towards his future achievements as a general and president. Since the image of the tapestry will be revised, the symbolic connection between the John Eisenhower sculpture and the tapestry is no longer relevant. The current proposal is to relocate the sculpture from the memorial core uh, near to the LBJ promenade in this location near the Department of Education entrance to strengthen the thematic relationship between the memorial and the Department of Education. Staff supports the proposed relocation of the sculpture at the LBJ promenade 
because this location will provide a more informal and approachable setting that welcomes visitors into the promenade to learn more about the Department of Education. This sculpture will provide a transition point between the monumental tapestry and the building. And also this location <coughs> is consistent with the proposed programming of the, pro the promenade. The revised figure will be seated on a low wall looking toward the memorial core. The sculpture can be seen at eye level, as you can see here. The associated plinth in will include an inscription from a homecoming speech that Eisenhower delivered in his hometown. The sculpture will still be in close proximity to the memorial core and the main building entrance and will continue to be life size. Finally, staff recommends that the design team considers how they relocated Jon Eisenhower sculpture and its associated inscription wall will impact the approved lighting plan. <coughs> and so with that, the executive director's recommendation is for the commission to comment favorably on the revised concept design for the Eisenhower Memorial, find that the overall placement, scale, and assembly of the primary elements have not significantly changed, find that the revised concept continues to satisfy the site selection design principles, requires additional visual studies and a mock-up of the revived tapestry that addresses any impacts to the LBJ building, requires a revised lighting plan consistent with the overall lighting design for the memorial that considers the relocated Jon Eisenhower sculpture and the associated inscript inscription wall, and finally requests that the applicant conduct section additional section 106 consultations to ensure that the proposed changes will not result in new or intensified adverse effects to historic properties. With this, I conclude my presentation. And I note that General Carl Redell, the Executive Director of the Eisenhower Memorial Commission, is here to speak on behalf of the project. Thank you. General, welcome back. Thank you, Vivian, for that helpful presentation. Good afternoon, Chairman Bryant, Executive Director Acosta, Commissioners. Thank you for the time to speak briefly. We've previously been here to present final site and building plans. However, since our last presentation, we found that we could not move forward without modification to the design plans we previously presented. As you know, we are here today to present three modifications in the revised concept design. Arrived at with the consensus support of our elected commissioners. We also have the full support of the Eisenhower family, as stated in a letter from Susan Eisenhower to Chairman Bryant and given to you this past week. Given other commitments, Susan could not be with us today. We also have with us today two of the presidentially appointed commissioners who are in support of the modifications. That's Al Gadoldi from New York City and Susan Baines Harris from Washington, D.C. I would now like to take five minutes to make a singular point about General and President Eisenhower before responding to questions along with Craig Webb, senior design partner from Gary Partners. My comments are from the perspective of a former military officer and a historian. And from that viewpoint, I believe that the central paradox of Eisenhower's public life as a professional military officer and civilian commander in chief was his commitment to peace, not to war. Raised and nurtured in a pacifist family, he became paradoxical, paradoxically both a professional soldier mastering the weapons and the organization of modern warfare, and also a passionate champion of peace. An extraordinary duality in a soldier who believed that war was not a solution to the nations or to the world's problems, but that it was mostly brutal, futile, and stupid. His views and heroic stature were formed through the experience of wearing the uniform in both World Wars I and II, the only president to do so. But most importantly, they were shaped and severely tested in the crucible of the invasion of Europe, 
on the beaches of Normandy. And Normandy became the historical hinge point of Eisenhower's transformation into heroic status as a world historical figure, resulting in the admiration and adulation of millions of people in the United States and throughout the world for the whole of the rest of his life. This did not happen in one fell swoop, but became evident shortly after victory in Europe when Churchill invited him to London to speak to the British about the war in London's venerable Guildhall. In Guildhall, Eisenhower eloquently addressed and convincingly explained to the British public why their sons had died under his command as supreme commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force in World War II. His heartfelt identification with the American heartland as a son of Abilene, Kansas was expressed then in London to these Brits, and again upon his first return to Abilene after the war, 10 days later, after receiving praise and plaudits in Paris, New York, and Washington, among other stops, before reaching Abilene. Eisenhower's profound personal identification as a child and young man with the values and ideals of Abilene, Kansas, a small town in the American heartland, never left him and remained a constant influence at the core of his character. However, the growth of his responsibilities for the security of millions at home and abroad changed and grew steadily for the rest of his public life, from Chief of Staff of the United States Army to becoming the first NATO commander to being overwhelmingly elected as 34th President of the United States and to assuming leadership of the free world during the Cold War. <coughs> He became convinced that American security must be defined and secured in a global, not national, context for America to be as free as possible. Returning to Pointe d'Elk and the shores of Normandy with Walter Cronkite during the Cold War, former President Eisenhower demonstrated his passionate concern for peace and his humble acceptance of the sacrifices made by his soldiers for peace, for all to see and hear, because he had come to know as a soldier that without peace, you cannot have freedom. It was clear as he walked the beaches of Normandy in 1964, 20 years after D-Day, that Eisenhower wanted the beaches of Normandy to reflect in peacetime the emerging light of the peace that makes freedom possible, not the dark devastation of war, not the satanic destructiveness of the Nazism, Nazism he defeated in World War II, and not the bizarre human abuses of communism that he fought against during the Cold War. In his own words, on his visit to Normandy on the 20th anniversary of the invasion of Europe, Eisenhower said, and I quote, every time I come back to these beaches, or any day when I think about that day, 20 years ago, I say once more, we must find some way to work for peace and to gain an eternal peace for this world. This was Eisenhower's final goal and his ultimate passion to enable and to ensure global peace so that his fellow citizens could be free to balance security and freedom so that democracy would survive and flourish in America and in as much of the world as possible and this is his legacy for all of us, as it is represented and symbolized in the Eisenhower Memorial. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, General Dell, very much. Mr. Chairman, please. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, thank the General for those comments. I think they're very timely as a, as a citizen and as a commissioner and as a retired 06. Uh, we appreciate that, and I think they're very timely, your comments about peace. And because comments about peace are always timely. Thank you. Thank you. We do have um, one person signed up, uh, Justin Shubo. Welcome back. Mr. Chairman, distinguished commissioners, my name is Justin Shubo. I speak on behalf of the National Civic Art Society, a nonprofit dedicated to the classical and humanistic tradition in public art and architecture. 
What we are looking at today is a radically changed concept for the memorial. Indeed, last month, Fine Arts Commissioner Elizabeth Meyer said the change was radical. The memorial used to be a narrative of a young Eisenhower symbolically looking ahead to his future accomplishments. That narrative no longer exists. The new concept is confused, illegible, and weak. Indeed, more than one fine arts commissioner said that the revised design is less coherent than the previous one. The applicant used to say that America's heartland is at the core of this memorial. This applied both to the tapestry and to the heart of the memorial core, which featured the statue of Eisenhower as a young man. That statue, we were told, was essential to the design. We were told that from the very beginning. Now, however, it has been placed behind, hidden behind the tapestry as if to say, pay no attention to the boy behind the curtain. We get the confusing phenomenon of young Eisenhower sitting smack dab in LBJ Promenade, a site already dedicated to another president. The applicant previously described the memorial as being based on the model of an object in a temple, as in the Lincoln Memorial. The young Eisenhower now sits to the rear of that temple. Furthermore, as you know, the Kansas landscape on the tapestry has been replaced by an image of the Normandy coastline, which oddly constitutes the second depiction of Normandy Beach in the memorial, the other one being on the bas relief behind General Eisenhower. The new tapestry image is banal and bland, lacking any beauty or obvious symbolism. It's a work of geography, not art. I've seen more striking landscape photos on my friends' Facebook pages. It's not even recognizable as Normandy Beach and neither as Normandy Beach today at peace. And it also features a harsh horizon line that extends the entire length of the tapestry. In sum, we believe that the radical changes to the design have resulted in a confused, incoherent proposal with an uninspired tapestry. This should be no surprise since it is the result of a political compromise brokered by former Secretary of State James Baker. It is a quintessential example of design by committee. Although my organization did not and does not support the previous design, it was at least far superior and this commission should require that that design be reinstated. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shubo, very much. Um, the, the, the EDR notes that that which is, its, its principal finding is that the major elements have not changed, and those major elements being the tapestry the structure, uh, the colonnade, the columns, landscaping, etc. So that which is before us mostly is that which has changed is the imagery. Um, Mr. Webb, I have a couple of questions, uh, if I might. Um, and I did see the, the CFA uh, letter, and I would say and I would acknowledge that the aesthetics and the imagery as art is not really before us. Um, that's more the CFA jurisdiction. How that image imagery and art impacts other buildings is something that is properly uh, before us. And I know that um, legibility, and in my case, I guess, more transparency if I'm a DOE employee uh, looking out. Um, and I remember when we had the mock-up of the tapestries before, and we were inside the DOE building looking out, I was pleasantly surprised at how transparent and uh, it was. Can you um, help me or us understand the new design and its transparency and how you are in the design process assessing it for its impact on those who are in the building? Sure. Um, so we are continuing to work with Thomas Oshinsky, who's the artist that um, has developed the process and the art, <clears throat> you know, for the, for the tapestry. Um, he's right now taking the image that you have seen here and starting to work that image as he had done before with the previous image in terms of creating the line work um, <clears throat> that would then become the woven stainless steel mesh um, that will compose the tapestry. And so I think you may be able to see in this image that the new image has more sky than the previous image. 
Um, they're not the trees that are extending up into the sky. And we think that this image is actually going to have more transparency than the previous image, um, which will do two things. One, give the Department of Education building, the LBJ building, uh, its presence within the urban composition, <clears throat> creating the urban space of the, of the room that this sits in. Um, and secondly, give views from the building out towards the memorial. So we think this is uh, going to be somewhat more transparent. Um, he is now uh, working on a number of sections of this, which mainly focus on the horizon line in the sky <clears throat> to start to test how to create um, the light and shadow and the contrast that's going to be necessary to create the readability of the of many of the clouds in this uh, in this landscape image. So uh, as we move along, I think we have a lot of confidence that we're going to achieve the same degree of transparency and perhaps even a little more. The image that was shown before of the degrees of um, transparency, the percentages, um, these uh, percentages were established to create um, the opacity for a wind tunnel test, which is really necessary for the structural design of the cable net and the columns. And these were established as maximum densities in terms of how wind load would actually hit the tapestry. We're expecting the density to be actually less than these values, but this would establish the maximum value that each of these sections of the tapestry um, could have. And I guess a little bit of a CFA type question is on the horizon line and the, the landscape, um, given proximity of a passerby, a visitor, looking up at it, how confident are you that that will be, getting back to the word legibility, how distinctive will the viewer be able to say, ah, I can easily see what that is, versus not being able to see and understand and drink it in as to what it is. So I believe there's an image from the memorial core looking toward the tapestry. So the, the focal point of the tapestry is Point de Hoc, which is yeah, the, yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, the cliffs that the U.S. Army Rangers scaled in the invasion. Um, and those become a third point in a composition between the sculptural elements on the right side, the General Eisenhower side, the left side, President Eisenhower side. You can see Point de Hoc in this image becomes the third piece of that composition, um, and which is the main part of the kind of ground plane of the, of the image. In other parts of the core, you're going to get views through the trees uh, toward the image. Mainly, I, th I think, though, what you're going to see is the sky, which we think is um, really uh, part of the kind of uplifting part of the of the memorial uh, the memorialization of the of the tapestry and so it, it's going to mainly provide a, a skyscape from further back focused on this central piece uh, and then the, the the coastline then becomes the kind of datum at the lower part so you're going to get glimpses through the trees this is the main focus of the artwork Uh, Commissioner White. Um, first, to the general, I also want to commend you for your comments and your message about peace, which is, as Commissioner Dixon said, is always relevant. It's very appreciated today. And I have a, a, a deep personal connection to um, Normandy, President Eisenhower, several family members who served under him, an uncle who's buried at Normandy. I've been to this site many times. Um, the most recent visit was for the 70th anniversary of the DB <coughs> invasion. I've seen the site from the air, and I'm puzzled, and it's really hard to read this image. I don't know that I would have recognized that that's Normandy Beach. So it could be just the presentation materials or the scale, but I would, I would love to see how this develops <coughs> so that people instantly recognize it. Um, and I'm not sure that I get it, even with you explaining it, which I really appreciate, um, but maybe when you're further along in the um, creation of this, it'll be helpful to see that. 
The, the second thing, and I would love to ask Mr. Webb to come back up, is I was really perplexed by the movement of Eisenhower, of the statue of Eisenhower as a young boy. Um, I wasn't convinced that the importance of the relationship to Abilene as the uh, contextual part of the of the tapestry was a, a reason. Um, I still think him looking out at his future and making that a relevant piece of, of what you're trying to portray here, especially Normandy and looking to the future. I'm just puzzled why he's placed in a, in a spot where you don't see him. And I, um, with all due respect to the staff, I don't see that the making that uh, Esplanade side a more um, friendly place or inviting place to visit the memorial overrides the concern I have for the, the boy who the statement says so eloquently as part of the man is removed from the context. So I'm, I'm really curious to hear how that came about. And then just my final point is I was really glad to see a letter from the Eisenhower family and I commend you for working through the issues with the family. I, it's very important to my mother <laughs> that the Eisenhower family be happy with this. I've heard from her on numerous occasions about this, so thank you. Um, I can report to her tonight that that's all uh, settled. So if you wouldn't mind responding, I'd love to hear the thinking behind the why. And so, Mr. Webb, uh, could you also identify yourself for the record sure. and speak a little closer into the microphone? Is it even on? Okay. Um, so we can pick you up. Thank you. Is that you. better? Uh, we know that it's on. Just lean forward. How about that? Yeah. Okay. Um, so as we uh, have been developing the design for the memorial, we've had quite a few conversations with the Department of Education. Um, a lot of it about the transparency of the tapestry, but also about the uh, programmatic use of the promenade. And a lot of that discussion focused on their interpretive programming of that space. Um, the western portion of the promenade, which you see in this image uh, moving off in, in the distance there, um, will be devoted to interpretive programming about the Department of Education that is based, uh, that is intended um, as educational programming for school children that are visiting the site. Um, and so we felt <clears throat> that by placing the sculpture of Eisenhower as a young man in this position in association with that interpretive program um, that school children visiting the Department of Education um, following the interpretive programming there might be inspired um, to see this life-size sculpture of Eisenhower maybe you know close to what their age might be um, that they would be able to relate to it maybe even kind of sit down beside or get very close to it and so we felt like uh, this is a more intimate setting for this piece. Um, it is definitely challenging. Um, uh, Sergei Ilambikov is working on this piece as we speak because we basically picked the sculpture up off of the wall and moved it. And the gesture and the placement is not quite right. So he is now um, rethinking the gesture. Um, we, this is our photo montage and he's definitely going to um, make some modifications to it. But we've, we felt that that, um, that movement and, that, and, the, and kind of creating this more intimate setting would allow particularly school children to relate more closely. Um, Susan Eisenhower herself really supported this move and she was uh, quite pleased with this position. Other uh, comments from commission members? Mr. Chairman, I would have to say that uh, I noticed that you were very careful in trying to deal with the, our position as opposed to the Fine Arts Commission's position. And I think that was very uh, important, and I, I support that. But I do think, i got to just say, I, I like the, the first one better mm -hmm. uh, because I think that the uh, second one is about war, this one, and the first one is about peace, uh, in my view, and tranquility. And I think the fact that Eisenhower kept coming back to his roots at home showed his appreciation for that more than the image of a, of a battlefield. And I think we did a lot with that with World War II Memorial. They got a lot, of that, a lot of that there. And I think this would be a great statement to young people about the value of the tranquility and peace of, of, of where he came from. And, and uh, 
I may be, we may be moving out of our range here, but I just <laughs> made the comment. <laughs> Gallus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, again, I also want to thank the general. I was very moved by your words. And uh, Eisenhower is a, a national hero that uh, it's an honor to be a part of celebrating his life. Um, I do have a couple of questions uh, thinking about, and I'm new here in terms of, I'm not new anymore. I know that. <laughs> yeah, okay. I was about to say, yes. getting old. But, but in terms of this, uh, this particular application, I'm I'm new to okay. it, and so I will uh, uh, start with that. But um, I, I guess if we could go to the comparison of the transparency of uh, the the old one, the original one to the new one, I just have a couple of questions. Um, I think it's 23 or something like that. 23. There we go. So my eye tells me a few things. I guess the first one is that the 95% the line looks bigger on the top than it does on the bottom. And uh, I think that's very important, at least the way I register this image. Um, I didn't put a scale to it, but um, my eye is telling me that the one on the bottom is lower. And uh, I, I, there was an earlier comment about the ability to register what we're looking at. And um, I believe that if, if that red line on the bottom was as high as it is on the top one, we'd have a better understanding of what's going on. And the, the, the difference between water and land and sky. Um, so I, I wonder if Mr. Webb, if you could comment on that, and then I'll follow with some other questions. Yes, you are correct that the 95% line is lower on the lower image. Um, this was the, the composition of this. It's, it's like a painting. It's like a landscape painting. And we spent a lot of time working with Tom Soshinsky and other uh, stakeholders in, in terms of, uh, in, including Robert Wilson, who has been advising us along the way here. Um, and also trying to select the, the height of the viewpoint. Um, we originally, well, we started actually with an image from the shoreline looking out to the sea, um, which we felt uh, that ocean horizon line was very powerful in terms of uh, uh, emotional content. Um, however, we felt that this image, looking from the sea toward the beach, was, was a better image because it showed more of the landscape of Normandy. And then we started more at eye level, as you would be on a boat on the water. Um, and in that case, the cliffs of Normandy were very much a straight horizontal line. Um, and so the composition was tuned by coming up, which gave us more of a sense of the land beyond the beachhead, um, more of a horizon line, and also more shape to the coast, um, accentuating Point de Hook more as it came forward. So there was a lot of time spent in terms of creating this composition. Um, and we also felt that <clears throat> the, the sky was very important. So. Um, I might add another point that this artwork gets transformed a lot when it becomes woven in stainless steel wire. Um, the lighter portions are the voids between the wire. The darker portions um, become the, uh, where the wire is. And the, and the wire is layered uh, in seven or eight layers to create the light and shadow and darkness. And so there's a. This is you know, not intended as a photographic image. It's intended as a work of art. And the, right now, what Thomas is working on is the kind of shade and shadow and the subtlety um, of the line work. Because it's really like a line drawing. The wire is like uh, the lines on an etching. And so there's a lot of work. And this image is going to change quite a bit 
Uh, this is kind of the, the basic canvas we're working off of, and then it's going to change from there forward. Yeah. So, and I and I don't know if the pressure for <coughs> sort of the trans transparency that Commissioner Brian talked about earlier is what caused you to uh, lower, if you will, the horizon from the original. Uh, but I do think it's at the risk of coherency. Mm -hmm. So we are maybe gaining transparency with a lot of sky, but the ability to understand what we're looking at is, is that. And um, so if, if you're looking for comments, that's a comment that I'd like to offer uh, that I, I'd recommend at least being able to see uh, the horizon. And the magic of the original, and I'm not going to comment on the theme one way or the other because I wasn't involved in that one. And I love this theme too, I'll just say. Um, but the magic of the other one was that the trees started at 95% and then they went on to 50 and 20. Here there's a demarcation at 95 where the land stops. And so your mind, in the other version, you registered this tree continuing even though it's less coherent at it, as it moves up to the top. And uh, whereas here, uh, it's sky and more sky. Uh, and so I, I believe that uh, we'd benefit more in understanding it uh, uh, with, with more, with more uh, density of the image itself. My second question is related to that, and it has to do with the 447 feet, okay? Now, I know that that must have been magic when it first was designed uh, because it, uh, you know, it fits the space. It was an it was an image that had three different rows of trees and all of that. I understand now uh, the focus on Utah Beach and uh, uh, what is it, uh, Omaha Beach and Pondahawk in the middle. Oh, I would like to know, and I don't know if you could show us visually where. No, 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 stay, please stay, please stay where we were. Um, where, where is Omaha Beach and where is Normandy Beach? Could you show us? So actually, that statement is not entirely true. I have to, we've found out since this was written. Um, the image, I think, um, and I have to get my notes, but I think that Omaha Beach is on the left side, mm -hmm. and Utah Beach is on the right side. And I think that Omaha Beach is actually cut off in this image. And I think that looking toward, you know, there's a longer view to the left, I mean, to the right. Mm -hmm. And I think that we actually are getting parts of it. But the, the, the beachheads are actually separated by a couple of miles uh, from Punta Hook. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that statement is not entirely correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what I'm getting at is, um, and I don't, I'm really not interested in trying to uh, start a new design process, but I, you asked for our comments, and so I have to give them. But um, <clears throat> it seems like we have tried to make 447 feet work here, seems like to me, particularly on the right side, where the image going beyond uh, sort of an equal amount of landscape on the left to the right would would also help us register more what's going on. And, and the, as the beach fades off, it seems less important. And so uh, I feel like we, we made it stretch to make 447 work. And I don't know where 447's magic is uh, in this process, but I think it, it hurts the understanding of, of what we're looking at. I'm not exactly sure what your question is. However, I'll uh, address the... It may not be a question. So the proportions and the shape of the memorial, uh, 
for those of you who've been here for the last seven or eight years, however long it's been, um, have changed quite a bit uh, in the process. Um, I could talk a little bit about that if you go back to the plan. However, the original tapestry was the entire length of the education building. Uh, and there were side tapestries in previous designs in many different configurations. Um, at the direction both of NCPC and CFA, um, there was a desire to have the Department of Education building as more of a piece of the composition. Um, and so from 4th and 6th streets, you see the ends of the building. So the tapestry, the two end bays of the tapestry were, were removed. Um, we felt that, um, you know, in this process, we think that the design of the memorial has improved because um, that particular move um, brought the, what, what's been called the temple in from the edges of the site. And so it um, made it stand more as an object within the site. Um, the threshold, uh, what we call the thresholds where you pass uh, between columns and come inside of this space uh, became more carefully defined. So through that process, which it took years to perfect, um, we support this. And so when we were given the charge to modify the image on the tapestry, we did not want to re, um, rethink that whole proportionality. Um, it is a landscape, and it does lend itself to a very horizontal reading. Uh, and so we believe the composition we've got now is the right one for the for this image. Mm. Okay. Uh, I'll just say I'm not convinced. I'll say that 447 was there, and we needed to make an image that that seemed to want to get to it. Um, but and I think it it shows that. Um, but uh, so in terms of that, that's a comment that I'm offering. Um, well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Other questions or comments from, yes, Mr. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to go back to the placement of the young Eisenhower. I mean, I'm just kind of still struggling with this because I think it makes a lot of assumptions like, number one, that mm -hmm. the Department of Education building will always be the Department of Education. There will be children's programming going on in that area. I mean, I think of something like the FBI headquarters where maybe GSA next year, or maybe we abolish the Department of Education, we decide to sell the building, redevelop it, and now this new condo building has a young Eisenhower sitting out in front of it. I mean, it's, it's kind of odd. I mean, it's, this also just struck me, I have to say it. I mean, he has his, he's turning his back on education here, too. I mean, it just feels like moving him back here and not somewhere in the memorial core in that room that you're talking about creating, it just it seems really ad hoc, and it kind of reminds me of there's a, down on the wharf project, there's actually something called the Maine Lobsterman Memorial that had to get moved because we're redeveloping all that federal space down there, and it actually became the subject of federal oversight legislation on the senator from Maine that was worried about whether it would look out on the water. So I think that not making this kind of such an afterthought by placing it outside the core, I think that maybe that should be rethunk. That's right. Oh, well, we had some conversation earlier today about how appropriate it is that today is Groundhog Day. Uh -huh. um, and it felt like that for a minute, and then I heard Mr. Schumann's testimony, and I thought, well, no, it's not exactly like um, the conversations we've had before. It, I'm, I'm disoriented, because it sounds like... Um, it sounds like, even though you were you did refute that, that you're not supporting the old design, the former design either. Um, so we're back to Groundhog Day, with the with the size of the mar memorial and 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 all of that. So, I, <clears throat> I I I too have to say that that I'm sorry to see the trees in the tapestry go. Um, Part of what I, I, I think is, has been so successful about the landscape um, uh, depiction in the tapestry was because it had such a the potential to play so beautifully off the natural landscape in the park. However, um, having seen the mock-ups in LA and here, um, 
in various stages, I have every confidence in the artist's ability to take the opportunity that's presented in the proliferation of clouds and not only achieve the transparency, but, but a, a different, but still stunning effect from an aesthetic point of view with the, with the landscape um, and the, the sky. Um, the placement of the boy, um, I, I understand that people, the, I, I can understand that it seems a little puzzling, but um, I can't even remember what year we did a design charrette at GS, GSA sponsored a charrette for design opportunities in the LA that would be created by the tapestry. And my recollection is that, that the Department of Education uses and intends to use this space for what they call read-alouds um, and all kinds of programming for kids um, visiting. So while, while it does kind of seem a little bit odd in, in, in perhaps, in, in the context of the previous design, I think it does oper it does it does present some opportunities for programming and the Department of Education and GSA can can and will work together to see that the composition on on the um, west side of the alley makes sense so I, 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 I've been very um, supportive of the design from the beginning. I, GSA continues to support the design with enthusiasm, and I think it's, it's, there, it's a cardinal change to be sure. But I think it's one that, that given the, the talent of the artist that's been um, commissioned to do this work, I, I'm confident that he can pull it off. Anything else from any, uh, any commissioner? I just want to express my agreement with Mr. Evans on the, the placement of the boy. It, it does seem very awkward. And if there is, is a cause to put something there, perhaps something else could be designed to be placed there. But I, but I agree. It, to me, it has always it has felt very unusual. Sensing we're nearing a vote, uh, I'll just uh, say my final word. If I were a CFA member, and the central question before me was the imagery, I may well vote against this. Um, properly before us, though, is the fact that the design plan itself has not significantly changed, and it does continue to be in keeping with the design principles. So. Um, I will base my hesitant vote in favor of this. Is there a motion on the EDR? So moved. It's Second. been moved and seconded. All in favor of the EDR say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Agenda item number 5C is approval of final site and building plans for the visitor's screening facility at the Washington Monument. Mr. Hart, welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. The National Park Service has submitted the final site and building plans for the visitor screening facility at the Washington Monument. The project was last before the Commission in March of 2014, and at that time it was at a uh, preliminary uh, design level. The project is before you today because NPS is looking to align this uh, construction project 
with the current elevation, elevator, excuse me, elevator renovation project now are underway. Since uh, I'm assuming we all know where the Washington Monument is, um, I'll just show this image that identifies the components that make up the Washington Monument grounds. <coughs> excuse me. Uh, these components include the um, vehicular um, perimeter uh, security barrier. That's this purple. Excuse me. That's this pink area. Um, the area that's the uh, granite plaza and flagpole uh, area, which is uh, directly adjacent and, and surrounds the Washington Monument. Then there's the um, temporary visitor screening facility that exists there uh, currently. It's at the uh, the base of the monument on its uh, on the eastern side of the uh, of the monument. And um, finally, there's the Jefferson Pier, which um, is a, uh, a small uh, temporary, excuse me, a small stone marker that demarcates uh, a symbolic center of the, the National Mall. Um, and it's really that point that is due south of the White House um, uh, and due west of the US Capitol. And that uh, Jefferson Pier uh, is located here. And I'll uh, be uh, talking about that in, in an upcoming slide. <coughs> Early in, in the design process, NPS identified a number of important program requirements. Um, these are just uh, the summary of them. They're the main topics. Uh, there were about 12 to uh, 10 to 12 of, of these uh, requirements. Overall, um, they were uh, concerned design, security, uh, the facility itself, and the capacity of the new building. NPS noted that uh, the new facility um, that they're proposing would have to meet these requirements for it to be able to replace the existing temporary uh, screening facility. Um, over a few years, um, uh, up until 2012, NPS conducted an EIS process to fulfill its NEPA responsibility. The EIS included six options, um, and NPS also identified the characteristics that the preferred option would, uh, would need to have and these are listed here. Um, it would have to be a, the least intrusive option. It would have to be reversible. It would have to minimize impacts to the historic fabric. And I'll note here that the Washington Monument, as you're probably well aware, is a National Historic Landmark that has that designation. Um, it would also have to have a direct route from the east and would, would have to avoid impacting the existing vehicular perimeter security elements. And the option uh, that they were looking at was a glass um, cube or box. After MPS identified this preferred option, it began to develop alternatives, um, and the option is, is you, that you see here are, are these alternatives. Um, the option in the upper right was chosen uh, by the, the Park Service and the consulting parties as it would be the least uh, intrusive. It was, it was reversible. It minimized impacts to the historic fabric. It provided a route from the east, and it did not, did not impact the existing vehicular perimeter security. Um, and so it uh, met all of the, or, or addressed all the char characteristics I uh, described in the uh, previous slide. So um, back in 2014, um, you saw this design, which is the preliminary design. And um, now before us is the final design. I'll toggle between that so you can see the, uh, that really we're talking about some fairly minor changes again, 2014, 2017. Um, the east facade has, um, uh, has changed, um, and really we're talking about, uh, in the preliminary design there was a, a door in the center. Now there are doors on either side of the, uh, the east facade. One is a in, uh, an, one that you enter, one is the, uh, an exit. Um, the, uh, also note that the granite base um, there is, uh, it, it used to be, in the, pre in the preliminary design, it was, uh, the base was really just a, uh, um, a metal emollient, and now there's a granite base, and this granite base is necessary to address the, um, the sloping, uh, the plaza actually slopes from the monument um, uh, towards the edge of the, of the, of the granite plaza. The um, final floor plan is shown here, the red arrow is the, um, the visitor's entrance sequence. Uh, the blue arrow is the exit sequence. Um, the entrance route, as you'll notice, purposefully not straight. It has a serpentine uh, look to it. And this is really so that visitors would slow down um, and allow time for them to be properly screened before entering into the monument. 
NPS is also proposing to relocate um, some geothermal wells it had proposed at uh, the preliminary design. Uh, in the preliminary design, these wells were located uh, to the north of the, uh, of the monument, and now they're being proposed to the west. Um, in case you're wondering, geothermal wells um, are used um, uh, to, um, they're, they're utilized, they utilize the, the, rail, the, the, the fairly stable temperature of the earth. Um, deeper than five or six feet, the, uh, the, temp the earth's temperature is a constant 55 degrees, uh, and it uses this in tandem with uh, mechanical equipment. That mechanical equipment is going to be located in uh, vaults, um, west, east and west of the uh, underground vaults, uh, east and west of the monument. Um, and it will, uh, these will be used to both uh, either heat or cool the building throughout the year. Um, the well field, <coughs> excuse me, um, each of these wells, uh, there are uh, approximately 64 of them, or 60 uh, uh, wells that they're, they're talking about. Each one of these wells is 12, 12 inches in diameter, approximately 20 feet apart, and between 200 and 400 feet deep. Um, as was explained in the, um, the uh, staff report, NPS is increasing the number of these wells um, to, uh, so that the heating and cooling loads for both the Washington Monument and this new facility um, can be accommodated, as well as reducing costs. So um, staff analysis was, uh, was fairly straightforward. Since there were only um, minor changes or below grade uh, components, uh, staff focused on the commission action uh, from March 2014 at the uh, preliminary re review. We've had, uh, the commission had three uh, requested items. Um, the first is detailed plans of the geothermal wells, identifying any impacts associated with them. The second is the uh, blast and ballistic analysis to inform material selection. And finally, uh, lighting design for the new facility. So here is a more detailed plan of the new geothermal wells, which will be, uh, as I uh, stated earlier, uh, now sited west of the, of the monument. These will be um, fully located below ground um, with approximately 12 inches of soil um, above them and then grass planted on top of them. So really, from the monument looking west, you won't see anything at all. It will just be what you see out there now. Um, below grade conduit will connect to the below grade vaults that house the mechanical equipment. And you can see the uh, conduit um, that are kind of indicated here. The geothermal well field um, that NPS uh, uh, presented at preliminary design had fewer wells um, as I noted, it, because it only was supposed to uh, accommodate the uh, new screening facility. This is a larger well field, again, because uh, they are looking to, uh, to uh, condition the air for the monument as well as the new facility. In addition, um, I'll note that the well field is um, south of the Jefferson Pier, so it will not impact uh, that, that marker. And staff is supportive of this change. NPS also provided information, including these drawings that showed the walls, um, which would be composed, and these are a section here on the left, which would be composed of two laminated glazing units that are on either side of a steel frame structure. In effect, these glazing units would, would sandwich the steel frame. The exterior laminated glazing unit will incorporate a metal mesh, and it will be used with an interior gla laminated glazing unit to provide ballistic and blast protection for visitors and employees inside the new facility. Staff is satisfied that NPS has provided the necessary information and supports the uh, proposed design. NPS, uh, and finally, NPS states that it hired an architectural lighting specialist to ensure that the site lighting is designed in, in accordance with the Illuminating Engineering Society of North America guidelines and that it is compatible with the nighttime illumination of other monuments and memorials on the National Mall. NPS also stated that the primary design intent for lighting is to provide adequate ambient light for circulation and security without obstructing nighttime views of the monument. Staff is uh, satisfied that NPS has addressed this issue as well. And uh, with that, it is the executive director's recommendation that the commission uh, note that NPS is proposing only minor design changes in moving the geothermal wells to a site west of the monument. Also note that NPS responded to the Commission's request from preliminary review 
and um, that the Commission should approve the uh, final site and building plans for a new visitor screening facility at the Washington Monument and the associated below grade uh, geothermal wells located west of the monument. And that concludes my presentation and uh, we have some NPS staff here to uh, answer questions or I could answer the questions either. Terrific, thank you. Uh, then the, the geothermal wells, they will serve only the Washington Monument? They will serve both. Both. Yeah, the, the, the monument and right. the, uh, the, the new facility, the sure. entrance facility. Questions for Mr. Hart? Is there a motion on the EDR? So moved. It's been moved second. and seconded. All in favor of the EDR say aye. 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 Opposed, no. It is approved. And that is maybe a, almost a record time in efficiency today. Um, no kidding. Thanks to everyone. We've uh, had a good meeting and, uh, and we are adjourned.